When people visit Japan, I think there are certain dishes that kind of capture people's imagination. Even if they don't like Japanese food or have never had Japanese food before, they can have a sandwich on the bullet train or they can have a curry or even just a fried schnitzel like thing at a local shop. And quite often, people will come back from their holiday and go, that was my favorite dish that I had in Japan. Of course, I'm talking about tonkatsu. Tonkatsu is a Japanese pork cutlet. Tong means, uh, is one pronunciation for pork in Japanese and katsu is short for the word cutlet in Japanese. So we're gonna go through, over the next couple of weeks, the regular tonkatsu, the katsu sando, the katsu kare, all of the different variations of tonkatsu. And I really think you're gonna enjoy it. We're starting with the regular old tonkatsu, and that's a fried piece of pork in breadcrumbs with a bit of cabbage and things on the side. So there's a few different elements. There's of course the pork, there's the, the sides, I guess, the salad type of things, and there's the sauce as well. So before we get to, I guess, the main event, let's get these other things out of the way first. Let's do our sides first. So I've got a nice big cabbage here, and I just wanna shred that really, really finely. Now you can do this with a knife. Just really, really finely shred it with a knife. It's uh, a little bit more difficult to do than if you use one of these. This is a mandolin, or in Japanese, the, the brand is Benrina. Benrina is like a play on words. It kind of means, isn't it convenient? And they certainly are convenient. So, and we just very, very finely shred this cabbage. I think that will probably do us. It's really nice and fluffy, and that's the texture we're going for. You can just kind of serve it like this, fresh, but I think it's a little bit nicer if you just drop it into some cold water. That does two things. Firstly, it washes it, not that it's all that dirty anyway, but also it just kind of leaches out a little bit more of the bitterness from the cabbage, so you kind of get a sweeter result. Just soak this in water for about 10 minutes, then I'll spin it dry and keep it in the fridge until we're ready to use it. Tonkatsu is usually served with tonkatsu sauce, and you can buy that easily from a shop. This is the Bulldog brand, which is very, very popular. You see it's just vegetable and fruit sauce, tonkatsu sauce. So if you can get this, you can just use that. If not, I'll show you a couple of different ways to do it. Next week's video will be kind of the full bells and whistles version, the kind that you get in a high-end tonkatsu place where they're definitely, definitely making the sauce themselves rather than just buying it off the shelf. But for the purposes of today, I'll show you kind of an express version, a way you can get this. If you can't get this in your local grocers, you can make it from ingredients that are pretty readily available. Starts with some tomato ketchup, some Worcestershire sauce, to about half a cup of tomato ketchup, maybe a, a tablespoon or two of Worcestershire sauce, some soy sauce, and then this is Japanese karashi. We could easily use hot English mustard as well, about half a teaspoon of that. Now give this a good mix so it's all mixed smoothly. You gotta really try and work some of the mustard in there. The Worcestershire sauce in this is really quite important because tonkatsu sauce is really based on a British style Worcestershire sauce. So adding those kind of spicy, fruity flavors is how we get our express version of tonkatsu sauce. But for now, I'll put this aside and we'll get on main event. Now for the pork itself, it may look a bit intimidating, but with tonkatsu, there are kind of two main types of katsu. There's hire, which is Japanese for fillet, or rosu, which is kind of Japanese for sirloin. So this is your pork loin, de-skinned and de-boned. So usually you've got bones that run in under here. I've asked my butcher to take those off for me, and he's taken the skin off as well. Now you can easily ask your butcher to do that. It took him about three seconds after I asked him do that for me, but you can also buy, say, a pork chop and cut the bone out yourself, a loin chop, or even a pork loin roast, and then just take the skin off that. Very easy to do, but even easier if you ask your butcher to do it. I'm gonna cook both varieties just to show you kind of how they're different. I wanna cut some quite thick cutlets, I guess. You know, that's the katsu, the katsuretsu. So I want this, let's say, maybe two centimeters thick. And with our fillet too, about one and a half, two centimeters thick. I've just got a couple of rosu or loin cutlets here and about four hire or fillet cutlets here. And one step that I think gets really, really overlooked is 
tenderizing the meat. Firstly, you wanna salt this really well. So before you're, you're frying or anything, at least 40 minutes in advance, you really wanna give the meat a good salt. The salt's gonna do a couple of things. Firstly, it's gonna season the meat, obviously, gonna make it a little bit saltier, but it also acts like a dry brine. So by salting this 40 minutes in advance or an hour in advance, it's gonna draw some of the moisture out of the meat, that's gonna dissolve the salt, and that's gonna get then reabsorbed back into the meat. So it's gonna give you a much juicier cutlet. The second thing you wanna to do to tenderize is poke a lot of holes in it. I prefer using one of these to, I guess, a tenderizing mallet. You can use a tenderizing mallet, that's totally fine, but I want a nice thick cutlet. And the more you pound with a tenderizing mallet, the thinner it becomes. You can also just use the back of a knife and give that a bunch of chops as well, but it's the same thing as the tenderizing mallet. The reason this is important is because Japanese cuisine rarely uses a knife and fork, even for your shuk or westernized dishes like this. So you're usually picking up a piece of cutlet with chopsticks and maybe taking a bite out of it. You need your teeth to be able to go through that quite easily. You don't want to be tearing at it with your chopsticks like a, a kind of caveman. So, poking holes all through this. And when you've poked a lot of holes, another thing you want to do is actually just put a couple of cuts into this nice, rich, fat cap that's on top of it. And that's to basically keep your katsu flat when it comes to frying it because the meat will contract, but the fat won't. And so what happens then, if the meat is contracting and the fat isn't when it's being cooked, you end up with this kind of buckled tonkatsu, which is not what you want. So just a few little cuts in the fat there will allow the fat to kind of open up and your tonkatsu will stay flat after it's fried. So then you just want to push it kind of back into its original cutlet shape so it hasn't flattened out too much, which looks absolutely perfect. And we'll put that away in the fridge for about half an hour. So that's salt to kind of brine. I'll do the same with these little fillets as well. I'll just put these in the fridge while I explain what we're doing over here. So we're nearly ready to fry our tonkatsu. Tonkatsu is a breaded cutlet. It's a schnitzel essentially. So you need, I guess, three things to cover your cutlet in. Some plain flour, some eggs, and breadcrumbs, of course. The breadcrumbs are really quite specific. They're panko crumbs. Panko is a Japanese style of breadcrumb and it's a lot fluffier and lighter than your regular kind of toasted Western style breadcrumbs. You can see how kind of big and fluffy these are and they're also very pale. So panko breadcrumbs are actually, they're, they're not made by, by grinding bread, they're made by shredding bread and it's shredding cooked bread that hasn't been browned. It's quite ingenious how it's made because loaves are baked usually and it gives them a brown outside and a white inside. But to get panko breadcrumbs, they actually rise the bread in its uncooked form by passing an electric current through it. It's quite ingenious. These are the ones that I like to use. This says, Sametemo oishi panko. And what that means is, even after it's gone cold, it will still be delicious, this style of panko. The reason I like this is because they're a little bit bigger in their flakes than the regular panko. Just some regular old eggs. So after about 45 minutes, you'll see there's not a lot of salt left on the outside of the pork. What's happened there is the liquid from the pork has come out, dissolved the salt, and it's been reabsorbed back in. So firstly, it's nice and juicy inside, and secondly, it's also seasoned all the way through. And now it's time for our coating. The most important thing when you're doing Japanese fried foods is that, and this is gonna sound a little bit weird, consider fried foods or deep fried foods as steamed foods. When Japanese chefs are taught the art of deep frying, it's not just about getting the crispy outside. The secret to good deep frying is about controlling the inside that's steaming. You know, there's no direct contact of the oil onto this meat. So in order to make sure that this meat is cooked correctly, we've got to consider that to be a steamed food because oil doesn't make fried foods soggy. What makes fried food soggy is the juices from the thing that you're frying coming out and wetting these breadcrumbs. So if you're overcooking things in its fried coating, what's gonna happen is the juices of the meat will come out and that's what's gonna make your tonkatsu soggy. So if, if you want it to be really, really crispy, you've gotta consider this to be steaming inside. And as it steams inside, we wanna take it out of our deep fryer at just the point before it starts to release a lot of its liquid. That's gonna give us a much juicier katsu inside and also it's gonna keep our outside nice and crisp. How do we do that? 
It's not just flour, egg, breadcrumbs, as you might for a regular schnitzel. Because you're trying to encase this steamed food, we're gonna do this about two or three times. Flour, egg, flour, egg, maybe flour, egg again, before we go in to our tonkatsu. So we wanna create like a nice package that's gonna hold our loin or our fillets inside there. So you've got this nice lovely coating that's protected from the juices inside. When you are doing this kind of crumbing procedure, it's best to go straight from the crumbs into our hot oil. So I'm gonna bring that up to temperature first to about 175 degrees. When you're doing this breading procedure, I see people doing it and getting their hands absolutely covered <laughs> in the coating. You may as well be deep frying your fingers at that point. There's a very easy solution to keeping it all completely clean. And that is this. Just a skewer, that's all you need to make sure that this process goes very, very simply. If you're using your hands, you're actually gonna leave fingerprints all through it. You're gonna, your hands are gonna rub off some of that coating that you're trying to create, particularly when it comes to the panko. And so you'll find that you have kind of your four fingers plus thumb print that goes into your tonkatsu. But if you use just a simple little skewer, and then you can use your hand to just toss a bit of the flour over the top, shake it off, make sure it's coated on the edges as well, then into the egg, and then back into the flour, then egg again. And you start to see we're building up a thicker coating of flour and egg that's gonna protect not just our cutlet from the oil, but also the breadcrumbs from the cutlet itself. In the egg, when you move the cutlet from the front to the back, that ensures you're coating all the sides as well, because you don't want just the top and the bottom, you want those sides to be completely coated in egg too. Drop that into the panko. That's ready for the oil. And because we've only touched dry ingredients, our hands are just about completely clean. I'll do the same with these little fillets as well. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to give you an exact time that you need to cook your tonkatsu for. It's gonna vary by the thickness of the cutlet. It's gonna vary between the fillet and the loin. The, the thing is though, it does make it quite easy because you're never really gonna cook just one cutlet. So put your cutlet into the oil and start a timer. But for the thickness I've got here, around three minutes a side is gonna be really, really good. When the meat starts to release some of its liquid, you can actually hear it. You can hear the liquid, the juices coming out into the oil. It's gonna to start to splutter and hiss a little bit. And at that point, you wanna take the cutlet out. So that means that you're starting to release a little bit of liquid. If you cook it more than that, you're gonna release more of the juices inside. You're gonna get a soggy tonkatsu. So listen for the amount of time it takes for that sort of sputtering to start. Take it straight out then, and then you know how long you're cooking the rest of your cutlets for, because they're all gonna be the same size. So I know my loin cutlets are taking around five minutes of frying to get to the point that I want. When you take the tonkatsu out, you wanna stand it up sort of on an angle to drain. You don't wanna drain it flat because that's just gonna let the oil pool inside that package we've created. If you're draining on an angle so it drains down to, I guess, the corner, you're getting rid of as much oil as possible. So you're gonna get a nice light tonkatsu rather than one that tastes really oily. In between cooking each cutlet, Make sure you're skimming away all of the breadcrumbs. The breadcrumbs and what's left in the oil is what's gonna change the taste of the oil. You wanna keep this oil as clean as possible, so constantly skimming with one of these, taking out all the rest of those breadcrumbs that will otherwise burn and foul your oil. The fillets are gonna take a lot, lot less, and actually you wanna cook them a lot less as well. You still want them to be a little bit pink on the inside, so these, I suspect, are gonna take just about two to three minutes for each one of these tiny little fillets. Now that looks absolutely fantastic. I've cut some tomato and some lemon for our garnishes. This is a bit of radish pickle called takwa. You can use any kind of Japanese pickle you like, but I think it's good to have a few slices of pickle on there, just as sort of a refresher when you are cutting into your tonkatsu. Of course, our cabbage, take a nice pile of that onto the plate first. 
And this cabbage is a lovely texture when you put it together with this tonkatsu. Lovely and crisp. So the way you want to cut this, it's a little bit different. You don't just want to go straight into it with a knife. You actually want to break into this casing that we've made a little bit first. So sort of softly into the casing first and then fast with a knife to go all the way through. And that looks wonderful inside. I want to show you what this should look like inside. You see when I squeeze it, all the juice that comes out of the center there? That is exactly what you're after. So this onto our plate. A little bit of pickle on the side here too. Some lemon and tomato. I'm gonna to put this tonkatsu sauce into a jug to serve on the side because you've got this lovely crispy tonkatsu. You don't wanna make it all wet with the sauce. So you actually wanna add the sauce a little bit at a time. And the last thing I wanna serve it with is just a little bit of Japanese mustard. Just smeared onto the side of the plate here. It may look like a weird presentation, but this is actually quite normal in Japanese cuisine. Quite honestly, I can't imagine a better tasting or better looking tonkatsu than this one right here.